So this work's been done with Jeff Clark, uh, Nathan Dashko, and Sandra Piazzolo, uh, and mainly to do with uh, Fjordland. So uh, primarily looking at uh, mechanisms of forming continental crust. Uh, so magmatic arcs are a very uh, important modern setting for generating uh, evolved continental crust material. And um, this is generally considered to occur by uh, igneous fractionation processes or partial melting of the deep crust. So we consider that uh, we'll produce some sort of residual material from these processes. If it's uh, igneous accumulation or partial melt residues, but they're commonly not observed in the geological record or in magmatic sequences we don't usually see much of this residual material. Uh, people think this is generally because it's so dense that it will actually return back to the mantle is, is a prevailing sort of <laughs> hypothesis. Uh, in Fiordland, New Zealand, luckily, we actually preserve much of the deep root to a magmatic arc. Uh, it's actually probably one of the deepest preserved in the world, and there is not too many. And we actually preserve um, garnet onsite uh, cumulates, and it sort of begs the question of how and what can they tell us. So a lot of the work I've done is sort of looking at how we can use this uh, information to look at processes uh, in natural occurrences from depth greater than usually considered or um, observed. And so I'll explore some depth uh, issues to do, to do with differentiation to produce the felsic continental crust and have a, have a brief look at uh, what processes might or mechanisms can control uh, the recycling of material back into the uh, mantle. So uh, a bit on Fjordland, um, it's considered to be the part of the magmatic, does that work? The laser won't work on the screen, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's considered to be uh, part of the Paleo-Pacific Gondwana margin. Uh, people have interpreted that the magmatic belt extends uh, broadly through West Antarctica and potentially into Australia. Uh, and so I'm worried mainly about Fjordland. So Fjordland, on the uh, western tip of the South Island of New Zealand. And it, we preserve components from sort of the, uh, from the Cambrian to the early Cretaceous in terms of arc magmatism. And they're in sort of two main episodes. Um, the main part that I will talk about is in Western Fjordland. So over on the far edge of this, this figure here, where we actually see much of the early Cretaceous um, portion of the magmatic arc, and we see quite a uh, large proportion of mafic to intermediate plutons uh, called the Western Fjordland Orthonice, uh, which have, we sort of preserve fragments from differing crustal depths, uh, anywhere between about 1.8 GPA and around uh, 1 to 1 1.2 GPA and they've been sort of patchily metamorphosed to higher intensities in different regions and to uh, lower intensities in places. And so I'll talk a bit more about that as I get there. Uh, in Eastern Fjordland, we do preserve parts of the shallower sequence as well as uh, up towards Nelson on the other side of the Alpine Fault, uh, as well as parts of the accretionary uh, sediments. Uh, so, the material is largely exposed from quite large depths, mainly related to uh, extension during orogenic collapse, uh, which is linked to the, the uh, opening of the Tasman Sea, and probably also assisted by movement along the Alpine Fault. Okay. So the timing mainly worried about uh, for myself is this sort of 130 flare-up event. So the portions of the arc that are preserved from uh, before 130, usually it seemed to be uh, represent depths of maybe about 40 kilometers. But during this sort of early Cretaceous period, uh, the arc has 
almost doubled in thickness from anywhere between sort of 65, potentially even deeper, maybe to 80 kilometers in thickness. This is uh, associated with a, a marked increase in the volume of magmatism that is observed. And we also see a change in the chemistry of the magmatism where we see an uh, increase in the strontium ytterbium ratio and generally a decrease in things like the hafnium isotopic signature. And so both of these are suggesting that we've got a very deep system where garnet is influential and we're probably uh, involving older crustal material during the formation of these uh, magmas. So the two main components that I will talk about are from uh, different depths within this thickened system. So the main one is the deepest exposed component that we see in Fjordland, which is the Breaksea Orthonice. Uh, represents probably depths of about 65 kilometers that has come back to the surface. Uh, it's, a, so it's a composite layered gabroic and diuretic uh, orthonice, and it's been metamorphosed at high pressure granulite uh, facies conditions. Uh, the other one is the Malaspina. So it represents about 40 kilometers uh, in a depth of formation. It's quite similar and it has been metamorphosed at lower conditions. Uh, so they're the two main ones that I'll worry about for the moment. Um, but there is predominance of material preserved around that 1 to 1.2 GPA. So at the base, in the Breaksea Orthonice, we preserve quite spectacular uh, assemblages where we get uh, garnet, clinoporoxene, predominantly omphocyte as the main clinoporoxene, um, and a, a main sort of monzodiorite that hosts them. So we have quite large pods of uh, interlayered uh, near monomineralic garnetite with clinoporoxenite. And then we also get uh, other layers and pods where we get integrose of garnet and omphocyte. Uh, and so, yeah, the scale seems to slightly vary depending on how much strain is associated uh, during the subsequent deformation and how much has actually been metamorphosed during that uh, period. Uh, in terms of geochemistry, on a TAS diagram, they, sh they form quite a strong linear trend. And uh, we do preserve in most of the ultramafic material uh, igneous textures and um, it, it, you know, it seems that they are a cogenetic link and the, these ultramafic to mafic material is accumulating from the uh, pluton instead of a, a metamorphic origin. So it's at about 1.2 GPA, we have rocks that are very similar in, in terms of texture, except we predominantly have diopside as the stable clinoporoxene. Um, we see smaller proportions of garnet diopside uh, material and mainly within a, a similar monzodiorite we also find quite large pods of hornblendite uh, and we do see as well as garnet bearing diorites we see uh, two pyroxene bearing diorites as well and this is sort of uh, an estimate of the proportions of um, the different units uh, from my field area. And so it gives a, a rough indication at, in the Breaksea Orthonice there is much more uh, cumulate material. So above this, above this these structural levels, uh, we have mainly tonalite and granodiorite uh, plutons as part of the separation point suite. And they have uh, sort of on Harker diagrams, they have broadly curvilinear trends to the Western Fjordland Orthonice in yellow here versus the gray. Um, and they have varying high strontium to ytterbium ratios. So it, it seems like they are forming from some, you know, they're related to the Western Fjordland Orthonice in some manner 
and it would appear that they're differentiating to produce the uh, separation point sweep. And so something that I was looking at doing is, you know, what, had, what has fallen out to produce these upper crustal uh, signatures and what can we see in the uh, Western Fjord and Orthonice. So, like I said, the rocks have been variably metamorphosed, appears largely in relation to strain. We have large uh, portions where we get quite what look like quite nice igneous textures. In higher strain regions, we get uh, metamorphic features. So these are, this is a picture of the garnet from an igneous domain, whereas the garnet is forming coronae in the uh, metamorphic domain. So we can actually pick out using textures and, ge and the mineral chemistry portions that are, uh, we interpret as igneous and we interpret as metamorphic. Um, so I won't go too much into the details, but we can use the heavy rare earth concentrations in garnet and uh, we can use some of the major element features that can be matched to the microstructure that suggests that uh, we have a variably overprinted pluton uh, at high pressure granulite facies conditions. So advantageously this allows us to actually look at some of the features of the rocks from their igneous formation and actually observe crystal sequences that are you know, generally can only be uh, established in experimental work. So in the break sea orthonice, we uh, preserve rutile X solution in garnet, which is consistent with very high temperatures. And the field relationships together with texture and features of mineral equilibrium modeling suggest that we're getting very early crystallization of garnet, clinopyroxene before plagioclase. Uh, and so these also match where we see the interlaid garnetites and clinoperoxonites, uh, the sort of garnet omphocyte cumulates, and the main monzodiorite host. In the malaspina, we get the change to diopside as the main stable calcic sodic uh, pyroxene. And if we, you can get can actually see variable changes in the water content and the fugacity of the system will influence the stability of orthopyroxene, diopside and hornblende uh, and garnet. So we can then use some of these informations, use some of this information uh, to sort of forward predict if we remove this material from the magma uh, what, will we, what trends will we generate and how does that relate to some of the upper crustal suites. Uh, so this is using some information developed largely off volcanic sequences in magmatic arcs and so we, we were looking more from how can we uh, assess it from the base. So most systems are generally about 40 kilometers thick and we see a strong influence of hornblende in the chemical evolution trends of the, the uh, magmas, which coincides with the, about the stability of where we get garnet and clinopyroxene being stable. So at deeper, in deeper systems, that's we would usually expect garnet, clinopyroxene to be influential. And if we get deep enough, probably at around 50 kilometers, we'll actually stabilize omphocyte as the dominant clinopyroxene. So I used trace element trends mainly to explore the difference between the garnet and the hornblende. Um, so lanthanum, euterbium and just, uh, is a good indication of garnet. So if you get a strong increasing trend, suggests that we're losing garnet from the sequence. Dysprosium, euterbium, uh, we get to, we allows us to distinguish between hornblende if we have a sort of negative slope and garnet if we have a positive slope. On this, on this diagram here. So the separation point suite is in red, if it, if it comes up, might be a bit hard from the back. Um, and the modeling suggests that most of the trends can be accounted for by uh, garnet omphocyte fractionation, and we get cumulative 
influences from horn blend as, we, as the magnums move to shallower, shallower levels. And uh, there is subtle differences between the effect of diopside versus omphacite in terms of uh, its fractionation influence, particularly silica and sodium in driving the uh, magma evolution. So in terms of Fiordland, most differentiation is occurring at depths greater than 40 kilometers and potentially up to 80 kilometers. And there's, as I said, cumulative effects as you uh, go further uh, up sequence. So this generally leaves a problem in terms of mass balance uh, calculations of the composition of the continental crust, which most considered to be some uh, around an andesite. If we're fractionating these systems, we must produce a, a high proportion of residual material. Uh, people suggest about a third of the batholith should be this cumulate or residue from melting, but we generally do not see it in, in the systems. We only see the felsic products. So it's considered that if uh, this material is going to be very dense and it can actually be uh, more dense than the underlying mantle and it can actually drip or fall back or fall into the mantle and be lost from the system. So it raises a few questions of firstly, we see some in Fjordland, why might that be so? And what sort of mechanisms control these uh, founderings, especially in complex uh, lower crustal terrains where it may not simply just be uh, residue sitting on top of the mantle. So it comes back to the metamorphic overprint and we can explore in uh, using mineral equilibrium modeling in pressure temperature uh, to find fields. The main cooling path of the break sea ortho ice <coughs> will involve uh, the production of eclogite facies mineral assemblages, uh, which is sort of about here in the Monzo diorite, and in a gabbro, it'll occur at uh, lower pressure temperature conditions. If we do so, we can actually generate a highly dense lower crust, uh, this being dependent on the composition of, of, of the system we're looking at. So if it's more mafic, uh, we can produce more garnet, more omphacite, making it uh, more feasible to, to founder. So in Fjordland, at least the material that we see, uh, the metamorphism was highly inefficient. We can actually calculate uh, how much of the material has converted and how much preserves the protolith um, uh, assemblages, which is about 35%. And this inefficient metamorphism inhibits uh, this density, density transition of some of this material that uh, is sitting uh, deep within the arc. So we need either greater proportions of cumulate material in a heterogeneous lower crust uh, to essentially lead to foundering. So if we do some calculations of uh, the unit uh, density of the systems that we see, uh, this is the break sea is sitting at about, I don't know, 3.25. This dotted line would represent uh, the ma uh, mantle density of 3.33 grams per cubic centimetre. The malaspina is at much lower densities. So we either need to have higher pressures or more mafic material, which is fairly self-obvious. So uh, we can actually calculate how much we, we need to lead to it uh, falling back into the mantle. Another alternative is we uh, induce high proportions of melting of this material, which could create more uh, mafic residue. So if we go back to Fjordland, uh, it seems like much of the material we see is obviously too buoyant to founder. It's preserved back at the surface. But what can we see at higher pressure? Uh, so geochemically in the break sea ortho ice, we preserve evidence to suggest that there was material beneath it. Uh, it's heavy earth depleted, consistent with garnet uh, being involved in its source. It also has an inherited zircon population 
And so it involves some sort of crustal uh, contamination at depths below what we see. We also see geophysical anomalies that could suggest that that mafic root actually extends beneath the uh, break sea orthonice. So it could still be preserved. It doesn't seem like melting was particularly persistent throughout the orthonice. It is quite dry. Um, and a lot of the uh, melt structures that are observed appear to be primary igneous features. The other thing that we do not see is a sequence between 40 and 65 kilometers. Uh, and it, it is somewhat speculative, but uh, there could be a high proportion of cumulate material residing in that depth interval. Uh, the Malaspina pluton actually geochemically preserves evidence of a high depletion in heavy earth elements, suggesting that it has lost a lot of material, much more than the break sea orthonice, and it's also much younger in age. So if such a density stratified lower crust uh, was present, how would it control foundering uh, mechanisms that are usually considered to sort of involve dripping of the lower crust back into the mantle or some form of delamination? So, if we look at what is preserved in New Zealand, we see uh, sequences of rocks in a reconstruction that are excised by a series of shear zones at different depths um, to fragment the crustal sequence that we observe. So it presents a pos different possibilities in terms of a stratified uh, sequence about how foundering may, may occur. Uh, some have propo proposed that we get a counterflow diapirism uh, mechanism whereby the dense residue will sink and melt rich material at the base will buoyantly rise. Um, the only issue we see in the structures uh, and the timing relationships in the rocks of the Brake Sea Orthonice and the Malaspina Pluton is that the fabrics are predominantly metamorphic and there doesn't seem to be that much melt uh, present at the time of their formation. Uh, so we've proposed that it feasibly a, a dense cumulate pile above the Brake Sea Orthonice could be excised along shear zones during uh, extension and that would assist in uh, bringing the buoyant lower crust up. Uh, so it, if this model is, uh, is true, it would present issues to many people consider the episodic changes in magmatic arcs from thickening to, uh, to uh, steady state systems where there are shallower sequences at about 40 kilometers to be related to the foundering of material at the base. So if this was the case, uh, the foundering would actually be related to that generation of, uh, of extension in, in the system. And so uh, in summary, in, in New Zealand, we preserve deep portions of an arc quite uniquely, which allows us to evaluate uh, histories of lower crust generation in magmatic systems. We can establish igneous and metamorphic histories uh, and to unravel different periods of, uh, of the magmatic system. Early Garner and Omphocyte contributed to significantly to the differentiation of the magma. Uh, incomplete metamorphism enhanced the ability to preserve material at depth and potentially cumulate material uh, could have been lost from the system during uh, gravitational collapse. And I'll leave it there. Any questions for Tim? Yep. Hi, that's very interesting and obviously very thorough work. I just have a question in relationship to the fact that there is clearly something which is missing there, 
and uh, the amount of the material that is missing, uh, and even the fact that it is missing, uh, seems to be derived mostly by mass balance calculations. And as we have something that we have to balance, and yep. therefore we require a certain component. But uh, those mass balance calculations presuppose, obviously, that there are equilibrium situations which are looking at. What, however, if there is this equilibrium somewhere in the system? Yes, well, yeah, that would easily change all of those mass balance considerations. And I think this system is showing that there is actually disequilibrium in how people would perceive it, because uh, most people would consider that the, these rocks at such high pressure would just be completely cooked by metamorphism uh, and transition. So, uh, yes, I think I'm, I'm, I can't actually put a number on how much that change would be, but yes, I think it's, it could conceivably be completely different. Yeah. yeah. So, how does it compare with modern art in terms of the thickness and, and the structure? Uh, so, in terms of modern arcs, the best. Uh, analog would probably be the parts of the Andes, where you uh, mm -hmm. get to, you know, <laughs> people think that they're up to thicknesses of 80 kilometers, um, but that's only in parts. Different sections could be much shallower. Uh, in terms of structure, uh, so the mo probably the most complete sequence is in Khoistan in Pakistan, and uh, that taps out at about 50 kilometers. And they are, and you do see garnet clinopyroxene within those uh, sequences. They do not have uh, true omphacite stable, though, so it, it's slightly shallower. Uh, their sequence is, is, is more complete in terms of uh, uh, from the 50 kilometers up. Ours is much more fragmented. Tracy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the main hornblendites that uh, were in my field area, it was a bit hard. We looked at trying to compare the chemistry to see if they were related to the immediate plutons nearby. And there was some age dates that had been pulled out of uh, one of the prominent ones, and it seemed to be older. Um, and so we couldn't really link it to the main part of the, the system. Uh, uh, it does have garnet in it. Um, so it's, the garnet looks igneous and you do get metamorphic garnet as well as how I would interpret them and so it, where I saw them it was slightly ambiguous I know in different parts of Fjordland um, the relationships might be much clearer but yeah yeah Tim, where you use the term there that slide there incomplete metamorphism and I think earlier in the talk you were talking about in, inefficient yep. metamorphism do you mean that you see the metamorphic reactions not going to completion, so that the, uh, in steps that then they're frozen and just didn't go on, and, and in other places you see them where that reaction has gone to completion? Is that what you're yeah, yeah, that's what I'm generally saying. Um, we I might not have a... Have I got... Uh, well, so some of the textures, uh, we get quite prominent garnet. Uh, coronas and most of the omphacite here actually has a uh, much higher jadeite content and we can actually look at the uh, oh, some of the modes and we in the parts that look metamorphic we have uh, much lower plagioclase modes so it suggests that we're actually uh, consuming the plagioclase and we can see that in the chemistry of the omphacite and garnet that they're consuming plagioclase to be stable uh, metamorphically and vice versa in the low strain areas we have much more plagioclase. The garnet and the omphacite don't have those uh, element signatures that would suggest that they're consuming uh, much plagioclase. <coughs> yeah? I, I don't recall you <coughs> mentioning retrograde metamorphic effects. Yep. Some, some of these textures you're referring to. Well, a separate metamorphism? Yes, they could. Uh, we do see I don't have a picture, or oh, maybe it's a bit hard to see. There is, there is some, some obvious retrogression of these samples. We do see diopside albite symplectites on the omphacite. So, but generally in where I was looking, those symplectites are absent or very small. And when we 
uh, assess the mineral equilibria, most of those assemblages are involving the st stabilization of, a, of omphacite, so they must be occurring at quite high pressures. Um, there doesn't seem to be an obvious prograde path because the pluton is essentially uh, being emplaced and cooling and then cooking uh, during that cooling period. So, I mean, you could sort of say that most of the path that we see is some sort of uh, retrograde, if you, if you like. It's a cooling path, yeah. Submit. Uh, thanks, Tim, for a great talk. Um, so, you've got data that indicates a NARC crustal thickness of, say, 60, maybe 80 kilometers. And when we look at the present day crustal thicknesses, say, the Andes, that's what we're getting. What does that mean for the paleo topography of eastern Gondwana at this time? What does uh, it mean? That <laughs> well, it's a good question. <laughs> it's, it's hard to tell. And, um, you know, an interesting thing is that the, these garnet rich. Uh, plutons that we have, you would expect to see lots of garnet in the sedimentary sequences uh, related to the erosion of the uh, of this system, but they're 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 absent. So uh, it is a, an unusual question to sort of know uh, what the actual topography was. I mean, you could do isostatic uh, calculations to make some sort of prediction, and it would suggest that there would be a reasonable mountain range there. Um, but yeah, where all that material is gone is uh, is a very good question. Yep. Just like to compliment you on the musical accompaniment. Yeah, yeah, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's thank the team again for a great talk.